Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 272. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm really happy to be talking with Dr. Michael Myers, the author of Becoming a Doctor's Doctor, a memoir. Michael, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you for having me, Laura. You're welcome. I'm so interested in your work at the subject of physician mental health has been something that's really been an interest of mine. And then recently with COVID, we've all become more aware of just how much stress healthcare professionals are under. So I, I'm really looking forward to discussing your book. But before we even get into it, can you just start off by telling our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and I've been at this for a long, long time. I finished my my training, you know, after, you know, medical school, et cetera, et cetera, my psychiatry training in 1973. And uh, my career until 2008 was always half-time private practice and half-time academic work. I was living and working in Vancouver, Canada, and I moved to New York City in 2008. And uh, at SUNY Downstate, I was the director of training and vice chair of education uh, until about five years ago. And now I'm there part-time and uh, I'm the ombuds person for our medical students. And I also play a key role on our medical student uh, admissions committee. And I continue to do, uh, even though I'm no longer in private practice, I continue to do a huge amount of work in the field of physician health. It's so needed. And I guess now more than ever, really. But, you know, like I said before, long before COVID started, I think physician mental health was really an overlooked area of of need. Yeah. Can you start off by telling us what drove you to write this book? Yes. Well, that is really the gist of all of this. And you've already kind of put your finger on a couple of things, Laura, just in the introduction. I really wrote the book because I want readers to know that doctors are human too, uh, that we're no different than the rest of humankind, and that we can uh, suffer from psychiatric illness, stress, and all kinds of things, and uh, like everybody else, make very good improvement. Uh, My book is full of gripping stories um, of uh, basically suffering human beings who just happen to be physicians, and I want the reader to see the power of human connection. A lot of that is based in psychotherapy, as you well know, and how healing works. And after reading my book, I hope that listeners will understand the immense strain that doctors are under, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, and how much they can benefit from psychotherapy and other treatments. And I also wrote the book because I wanted readers to understand how hard it is for doctors to get help in their hour of need. There are a number of barriers to life-saving help, and stigma is the biggest one. And too many doctors are suffering needlessly, and too many doctors are giving up and becoming quite ill, and some are dying by suicide. I'm sure you're aware of that. I'm also hoping that the book will attract young people uh, to the field of physician health. I'm reaching out to medical students and doctors in residency training, early career physicians, other mental health professionals who are looking uh, to where there is a need. Yeah, I think what you said about how difficult it is for doctors to get help really kind of resonated for me because I know you mentioned stigma is a big barrier, but can you talk about what some of the, to me, I think that there is a certain personality type that decides to become a doctor. I don't know if it's personality type, but a certain type of person who becomes to decides to become a a doctor because it's such a grueling process. Do you think that there's an aspect of that, like people who are super high achieving, driven, becoming physicians, that it leads them to feel they shouldn't need help or something? Absolutely. Yes. And so so, so let's just leave stigma aside for a minute and uh, develop what you just really mentioned, which is true. I mean, as you know, it's not an easy field to get into. Very competitive. Lots of hard work. Uh, even getting there and then staying there and then and then actually developing uh, a successful career where you provide good you know, good medical care, good research or good teaching or something like that. 
And so what, what, what that results in then is this, is this, well, sometimes it's denial that, you know, that I could maybe suffer from the, the, uh, the, the illnesses or the issues that my patients suffer from. And other times it's just really got to do with this sort of ruggedness. And there's this, despite, for instance, like I lived through, because I've been at this so long, the whole era of increased numbers of women in medicine. And, and that's been wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But even despite that, though, there's still this kind of macho uh, sort of mystique or whatever you want to call it to many branches of medicine uh, where to sort of become ill uh, or um, to need to get help is just it feels taboo and so that's why in, in my practice looking after so many physicians there was just this sort of sense of they're feeling less than and guilty and embarrassed and um feeling that they're copping out or that the doctors remaining are having to cover for them, do all their work. And, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible burden for them to feel. And that connects with perfectionism. You know, you have to be somewhat perfectionistic to even get into medicine. And, and the, the downside of that is, that is that physicians who are too perfectionistic are extremely hard on themselves. And they don't give themselves really any any room for their humanness. Yeah, I can see that. I can see what you're talking about. And, you know, when you think about, gosh, I remember when I was in undergrad, I took a, I mistakenly took a general education biology class that was supposedly the one that all the pre-med students took because it was so grueling. And yeah. I could not get through the class. I mean, I'm an intelligent person and I was doing all the work and all the reading and I just like couldn't do it. Yeah. And I, yeah. that's probably the only time I've had a, a class where I just literally couldn't understand the material because it was so in depth. And, you know, the, I talked to the professor and she said, look, this, everybody else in this class is pre-med. They're all like comparing their grades who got the A plus and, you know, this isn't for you if you're just, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're just trying to get a science gen ed out of the way so you can graduate. Yeah. I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> drop that <laughs> class. <laughs> and and Laura, when it, yeah, you're so right about this. One of the paradoxes or ironies of this is that people think, you know, because we're in medicine and uh, they, they think that you know, and we would recognize if we're developing symptoms or getting ill, that it would be a no brainer. You know, we'll just call up our primary care physician, go get some help, get referred on if we need to be, get proper treatment. And away we go. Uh, but it isn't like that. So many physicians do not have primary care physicians. They recognize stuff in themselves that maybe go directly to a specialist, but they don't always get it right. They could actually be, be, be consulting a doctor in the wrong branch of medicine. Too many of them actually begin to treat themselves. That's in, what I was thinking. Yeah. Way. And that's not good. I've looked after so many doctors who have done that. And oh, I can't tell you the relief that they express at the end of their first visit with me. I mean, they, they, they literally take a huge deep breath, sometimes get teary eyed and say, I am so glad to be here. And then they look at me and say, Dr. Rose, do you know how hard it is to treat yourself when you're the patient, you know, and, you, and you're not feeling well? You can't make, you know, correct decisions about yourself, whether it's self-prescribing medication or whatever it might be. And so just, just the relief of actually sharing all their troubles, whatever it might be with another human being. And then, and then connecting with that person, like this is somebody who's actually going to help me. It's just, well, it's like, this is what, you know, the doctor patient relationship is all about to begin with. But for so many doctors, they really, they really resist, you know, taking that first step when they do, then you can really do great work. And you know, I've, that's why my uh, whole career has been so rewarding uh, and so interesting and, and fascinating. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I just, when you were telling, sharing about that, it, it, just brought this thought to me of like not being burdened to carry everything alone, you know, not feeling like they have to do it all on their own. Yeah. And so some of them, of course, will maybe kind of share some of this with a spouse, sometimes with their kids or parents, or whatever. That helps to some degree. But obviously, it works, you know, so much better, too, if they'll say, look, you know, let me see if I can get you, you know, partly get you the help. I used to get phone calls from family members of doctors, some who were sometimes physicians themselves, asking me if, 
you know, saying, I'm calling him on behalf of my father. He's really been struggling and we're worried about him. And he's open to seeing you, but he just, he can't make the phone call, Dr. Myers. Would you be willing to see him? I said, of course. And I said, if one of you can accompany him to the first visit, just wait in the waiting room. That will ease the journey. And it does. And then, you know, they don't need to come for further visits, but it's just, it's just so hard to just take that first step. Yeah. You know, a lot of people who are listening to this are therapists who may be interested in how they can best support their clients who are physicians. I know I work with a lot of healthcare providers, but not any doctors myself, mm-hmm. but I've, I've heard mm-hmm. from other clinicians who work with doctors that they can be very, you know, intellectualized and have trouble sort of like tapping into the emotional aspects of what's bothering them. Yes, that's right. I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the, the issues that may come up that therapists could be helped by being aware of when they are working with doctors who need some support? Uh, Laura, I'm thrilled you asked that question. I was hoping you would, actually, (laughs) because there are some what I would call 101 type questions here uh, or statements. The first one uh, that I always advise when I'm teaching courses on physician health is to never forget that the person opposite you in your office First of all, it's just, you know, a suffering human being who just happens to be a physician. Okay, so that's the first one. And because when you do that, then you don't make assumptions about this individual that because they're a physician, they kind of probably know what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Or they might know this or they might know that. Because when we do that, we tend to skip and avoid asking things that we would normally ask all of our other patients. But we are either think that, you know, if, if the physician is feeling that he or she will tell me mm-hmm. because, you know, we're both professionals or something or they know. But so and the other thing, too, is that sometimes um, therapists can just also be embarrassed. And they think, well, you know, he or she's kind of a person of stature. I'm kind of a little embarrassed to ask that question. But when you get used to this and just start treating them just like as you would anyone else, then you're going to do extremely good work. And they will be the benefactors of that because they will realize that, sure, they've got the persona. Oh, which, by the way, because you are correct about using sort of intellectualization, sometimes medical jargon, things like that. And as you well know, those are all defenses. And I always tell people to just be patient with a physician patient that in the early uh, days or visits, Visits, he or she may need to to kind of use that oh, physician, physicianly mantle or armor uh, because they're they have to ease into the patient role that it's going to take them perhaps a little time. So if you can be patient and just kind of kind of put up with a bit of that, including maybe even a sort of sense that they're kind of assessing you or judging you or something like that, just kind of accept that. This is somebody who, who inside is probably kind of frightened, ashamed perhaps, maybe depressed and covering it up because of sort of the work we, we do, you know, as, I mean, you know yourself as a professional, when we're working, we always kind of have to be on. Yeah. yeah. In fact, so often when I would get a phone call and to see someone, my first visit with that physician would be because something had happened at work. I'll just give a quick example of a doctor who said, I, I called you because something happened last week at work. It really was a wake up call for me that I'm in trouble and I need help. And what it was is that I had a woman patient opposite me who I've known for some time. And I asked her a couple of questions. She said, Dr. Brown, are you not listening? You just asked me this two minutes ago and I gave you the answer and you know the poor guy was mortified and what he recognized then is that he's not as well as he thought he was that he could cover up this cognitive slowing he was having or memory difficulties usually often associated with an untreated depression or something like that and he realized now he said you know I I think it's showing and I need to get help and also I don't want a mistake I don't want to make a mistake you know I don't want to commit a medical error and so by the end of the visit you know I'm relieved he's relieved she's relieved that they've come so yeah you know and I wonder too too, if like that's another barrier, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I I think about it as a therapist. Like if I if I have a situation that I don't know how to handle, what I should do is go to consultation with my colleagues and or supervision of some kind to get another perspective. But what we sometimes do is feel ashamed that we don't know. 
and try to hide that we feel inept or inadequate. And because we think that if anyone knew that, then somehow we would be, you know, exposed as a fraud or something. Sure, exactly. Yes. And, you know, I think that physicians themselves, you know, we can struggle with that as well. You know, either the imposter syndrome or whatever it might be. Uh, and as therapists, too, I mean, we can you know, struggle with that at times as well. One of the points I make in my book, actually, certainly not with all physicians, but with certainly some of them can be very, very complicated. And, you know, strictly, and I'm kind of using the biopsychosocial model here now because, you know, being a physician slash psychiatrist. But for instance, I may be, this may be a situation where I'm really much better providing the psychotherapy and having a colleague do all of the medication management or the other way around. But I may, you know, because it's complicated and I'll, I'll do the, you know, the stick handling of the medication and work with a therapist, for instance, who is doing the psychotherapy, you know, with this particular physician. And then, you know, we'll communicate with, with each other on a regular basis to make sure that we're in sync, that there's ever any change of direction from my end or their end, that, you know, we're collaborating on this. But then there are other times, too, when I need other professionals, like if there's a history of substance use. I'm a generalist psychiatrist, so there's going to be times when my physician patient is going to need an addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry specialist. If there's a question of, say, a traumatic brain injury, um, any type of thing, then I'm going to want a neurologist involved. So that's what I try to do. And I think at the end of the day, the patient then ends up, you know, with a, you know, with a better so better equipped team, you know, when it's when it's really complex. Oh, and one other point I want to make too that just because we're on this subject, one of the things I've learned over the years is that too often um, physicians, you know, they're in a way putting their best foot forward, but we can make the mistake of, of being sort of seduced into the sense that we're getting the full picture here because my patient's a physician. But what, but what we don't realize is that he or she can really just disclose as much as they're either comfortable disclosing or that they're capable of uh, because of the way they're feeling. And I've learned the hard way when I haven't, with permission, gotten what we call collateral information from intimate family members, that can be a problem because there's just often so much stuff going on at home. Uh, that the spouse or kids are so worried about that my physician patient is not able to convey to me. So that's another plug I make in the book is to make sure that you involve family members, especially especially when a physician is really quite symptomatic. Yeah, that's a great point. Not that the, the physician patient is deliberately withholding information, but they may just not even see hmm? how much what they're dealing with is impacting them and and their relationships. That's right. That's right. I put a whole chapter in. I'm, I also do couples therapy, which is a little bit unusual because most psychiatrists don't do that, but I do. And I put a whole chapter in on that as well in the book. Yeah, which which readers have found pretty interesting because I'm you know also you know sort of not you know I've been, some of them I'm looking not just at their marriage or the relationship they have with each other but the fact that one or both of them may be also bringing uh, an illness you know into this relationship as well. So for instance, there's one couple that I wrote quite extensively about in the book that I wanted to share because. I'll never forget them. They were, it, it's disguised. They were a lovely couple in uh, the early 60s. And I'll never forget the chief complaint that the woman said, uh, we're here because it's called mopping up after the affair. And I, like so many people, kind of made the assumption that her husband you know, had had an affair. Well, that was certainly incorrect. And it was all about her. And um, she felt dreadful. And he felt very, very um, worried about her. And then as I explored this much more and how the individual that she had the affair with was so, quote unquote, inappropriate that I realized, oh, my God, she's been suffering from a low grade bipolar illness for some time now. And then it was further documented by her husband and even by herself a little bit. So what I was able to do, the long and the short of all of this, was that I was able to treat her individually then for a period of time, both with the appropriate medication, but also with important psychotherapy because her self-esteem and her social embarrassment about this was so profound. And um, she had had a postpartum depression some years earlier, uh, but without uh, any evidence of hypomanic or manic symptoms. This would come on later. And her husband, bless his heart, I mean, he was just a lovely man. They were both physicians. He was so supportive, and he was just thrilled to have his wife back. 
uh, very forgiving, very understanding. And of course, this meant a tremendous amount to her. And I got the chance to meet their adult kids who they didn't know the full story, which is appropriate and fine. But they were also thrilled to see their mom kind of get back to who she was before, before all of this. So it was just sort of an example of, I felt, really kind of a, an important story in a, in a book on becoming a doctor's doctor. Yeah, I I mean, those are things that I hadn't even thought of, too. And the fact that you do couples counseling, I think, is really valuable. Thank you. Can you talk about, I think one of the things we haven't really touched on, but I find this very compelling, is the idea of moral injury mm-hmm. as it impacts physicians. Yes. Thanks for asking about that as well, because this is extremely important. And it's kind of newish the last few years where, it, uh, first of all, I mean, it's so much of the original work is in the military, mm-hmm. but how it's come into the healthcare field, because it's not just physicians, it includes nurses as well, but just restricting this to physicians was because there's been pushback about the diagnosis, well, of burnout in physicians. And as you probably know, burnout is not in in our DSM classifications mm-hmm. and illnesses, but 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 it's it's been a term that's been used for such a long time now, for a couple of decades, on that syndrome in physicians where they get really depleted. You know, and it's it's not just fatigue; it's what I would call the sort of an erosion of meaning and purpose in their in their life, or a sense that they're not really helping anybody, and then this kind of detachment. You know, they lose their warmth and empathy and things like that, which is very demoralizing for doctors. But because some physicians have felt that 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 the burnout is kind of blaming, they've really felt that the term moral injury fits much, much better. And in many respects, it does, because sometimes they feel the reason I'm struggling with this is because I feel that I'm having to practice medicine in a system that is not right. Yeah. I'm, I'm having to see so many patients uh, in such a short period of time. It's become very mechanistic. I have to get put on a computer. I don't get as much time with my patients. I don't even get to make as much eye contact. I don't get as much time to even touch them. That was before the pandemic. And it's just, it just, it's a, it's a kind of corporate business model that is just really, really disturbing. Them. So there's that. It's the recertification. It's just so many things about the everyday practice of medicine today for many major many many doctors is 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 not good and it it you know it makes them ill and um and so in, for them to then say you know this is about moral injury i'm not i'm not allowed to practice medicine as i was trained to do and i'll just i'll just give you one i think very good example of this at the very beginning of the um, of the COVID pandemic, where our, our city, New York City, was the epicenter here. Yes, uh, my colleague and I were doing support groups every once a week for the critical care physicians, the emergency docs, the pulmonologists, et cetera, at our hospital. We were right on the front lines, and I'll never forget this one doctor. And they were oh, they were so stressed. Their patients were dying just so rapidly, and so many died. But I remember him saying, you know, this is really weird. I don't feel burned out anymore. I'm tired. I'm sad. But I feel I'm getting a chance to practice medicine the way I, I, I'm, I've been trained for this. This is how I was trained to look after seriously ill people. And I'm not having to worry about so many of the bureaucratic things associated with this. So, so you said at one level I'm revitalized. So it's a, it's kind of an interesting take on this that he felt that you know, he was really doing good work, important work. So. Well, gosh, I'm glad that he had that perspective. That's yes. that's really talking about finding a silver lining in something yes. horrible that you're going through to be able to say, but yes. I get to do what I really love doing and helping people in a way that feels meaningful. It's really important. Yes. And Laura, you know how you mentioned earlier about sometimes how doctors will use you know, quite a lot of intellectual language and things like that. Yeah. What we've been finding in our groups is that because of this pandemic, uh, and there's just been so much uncertainty with this virus, I mean, it's a little bit better now in terms of the treatment algorithms that doc- doctors have, but it's been, it's been really, really difficult. So, but what we've noticed, though, is more of an open display of emotion so that physicians will indeed talk about those feelings. And that's been really, like, very, very important. And I think they feel better for it. And those they train 
the better for it. Uh, so it's it's quite a sea change. Yeah, I wonder if um, I wonder if it's one of those things where it's like there's a collective awareness that this is a horrible thing. And so physicians feel that it's okay to show that it's horrible for them, or is it maybe that it's just so horrible that they can't hide it? I think it's I think it's a bit of both, actually. I think we're physicians where they don't have perhaps that kind of control uh, over it as, as they maybe once did because it's been so, and for some, traumatic, as, as well as, as just this collective sense that we hear in that adage, we're all in this together. And because of this uncertainty, it's been extremely humbling. Everybody admits that. This is very, very humbling, all of this. And because of the fears of contagion and isolation, we've all felt. As you probably noticed, the word loneliness has crept into basically the scientific literature. There there are now articles and research studies on loneliness. And because that's the predominant emotion that so many people are feeling because of our social distancing, our isolation, our sheltering at home, the missing of of tactile sense of touching, hugging, um, seeing people in person, all that, all that kind of stuff is, you know, it's affecting, you know, the whole world, including, of course, our um, frontline workers. Absolutely. And I, I hear from people that having to do their healthcare work in, you know, the mask, the face shield, the protective clothing, you know, and their peripheral visions cut off and you can't see who's walking up next to you. And, you know, there's this feeling of you don't even know who you're working with because you can't even really see their face. I know. That's right. One of the things, too, that we were heard from physicians in these early groups is what they would do. They would take their, their badge, like their name tag, and put it in some sort of like plastic covering or something, leave it outside or make it visible to their patient yeah. and still have their sterile gown on and their shield and their mask, their N95 mask, all of that. But they wanted a way for this terrified patient to be able to see their face to, you know, because otherwise they could maybe just see their eyes. Mm. I thought that that was such a novel, creative thing to do to to basically try to forge as intimate uh, a doctor-patient relationship you can at this very precious time in the patient's life. Because as you know, your family members were not allowed to come into the hospital, so they're all outside, and the physicians and nurses are having to FaceTime um, the patient with their family members, and so they've been They've been acting uh, sort of as go-betweens and things like that. Um, it's It's been tough. So anything that they can think of to kind of ease that journey for those dying patients are amazing things that I found that you know, our healthcare professionals have been, have been doing. So it's, it is just, it, it is so commendable. And, um, in, in fact, I'll just add one thing. I remember in those early days, so many of the physicians saying that they feel so handicapped, they feel so useless. Uh, that there's nothing they can do. That patients are going on respirators and dying so rapidly. This is before we had really any any of the things that we have now. But one thing that Dr. Viss, my uh, my co-facilitator, and I would say to them though is, don't forget though all of the sort of non-technical things that you are doing for these seriously ill patients. Just being present, showing up, talking with them as best you can, trying to answer their questions. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, means a great deal, you know, to individuals. You know, the so-called art of medicine is basically what we, you know, wanted to remind them of. That's such such a beautiful reminder because I think that for any of us, when we see someone in so much pain, we want to make it better, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or both. And and when, you know, there's a sense of powerlessness to be able to do anything about it, we have to remember that our compassionate presence really is doing something. I love what you just said, compassionate presence, because that's so true. I remember a doctor saying that he had one of his patients who was clearly dying, the patient actually asked him, said, doctor, am I going to die? And he paused for a moment. This is what he told us in the group. And what came out of his mouth was this. 
we're going to do everything in our power to to help you and to keep you comfortable or something like that. And so that was fine. But why he put that under the group, out, out to the group, was to just kind of find out what sort of the rest of us felt about that. Because at one level, he felt he was being dishonest. Mm-hmm. At another level, though, he felt paralyzed. Like, what what should I say or something at a time like this? Well, Dr. Viss and I really didn't have to say anything because... All of his colleagues said that, well, they basically clapped and said that you, you did, you, you did that right or you did that well or something like that. And I had to agree, you know, trying to just kind of project if that was me, I think hearing that from my physician would at least give me some sort of comfort at that, you know, at that time. In, in my life, uh, without him having to be specific, and the patient did die two hours later. Mm. But I, I was left though with a feeling that what he said was, you know, you know, was comforting in some respect to that patient. Yeah, it's like you know, almost like looking beneath the words as we do when we are doing our emotional healing work with clients that or patients that. They were they were asking out of fear, and yes. the, the person and the physician's response was reassurance yeah. and comfort. Yes, like yes, I'm here that, to help you. Yes. In fact, Laura, yeah, you, that's reminding me of a piece because you said I, he said I could see the fear in his eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, Am I going to die? Yeah, and if he were just to answer yes, you are going to die, would that have made it better at that moment? It seems that, you know, he was responding yeah. to the emotional need that was being expressed really more so than the words. Yeah, because see, this is a very different situation than, say, in another one where maybe, you know, somebody is, you know, has developed, you know, severe metastatic cancer or something. And, you know, the oncologist does need to say that, you know, you know, this is going to, you know, be life threatening or. And then they get into a discussion of, you know, how much time he or she might have, all that sort of stuff. See, that's a very different scenario than this one. So, yeah, I see that because the second scenario is more about what am I really looking at here? What's the next mm-hmm. step? What do we need yeah. to do? Treatment yeah. planning. Yeah. yeah. And please be honest with me, because if I've got three or six months or something, there's a heck of a lot of stuff I need to get done. Yeah. Don't yeah. give me false hope and when exactly. there's really no, yeah. nothing that's going to make yeah. this better. Yeah. That's right. Oh, this has been such a poignant conversation and, and I'm enjoying talking with you, but it's a sobering, somber mm-hmm. subject at the same mm-hmm. time. So, Michael, can you tell our audience where they can find your book, Becoming a Doctor's Doctor, a memoir, and, and everything that you're doing? Sure. Yes. Uh, with regard to the book, it's on uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, uh, sort of on the, on the Internet. It's not a bad I would I urge everybody to, ha- to have a look at my website because I got a lot of stuff on that, www.michaelfbyers.com. I've got sort of a lot of information. I've got a lot of podcasts on there on so many different dimensions of physician health, various sort of talks that I've given. Some of those are translated there as well. They're available. And, and plus, there's my email if anybody wanted to you know, reach out to me and ask about any particular things. I'd be certainly you know, very open to that. But it is, it's, it's, you know, I try to, I try to keep it fairly up to date with regard to, you know, well, important information in in the world of physician health. Wonderful. I think it sounds like your website is a really great resource. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll put links to where people can buy your book and to your website on, on the show notes for this episode. But I just want to thank you again for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. And thank you for having me again. I'll say that a second time. It's been wonderful to talk with you, Laura. You too. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.